Welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure to open this uh, inaugural lecture of Professor Milena Pavlova. My name is Stef Kremers. I'm the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Health, Medicine and Life Sciences, and I'm the Pro-Rector of this academic session. Milena has been appointed Professor of Health Economics and Equity. And as Professor Milena will continue to build on her pioneering work on formal and informal payments for healthcare services in the Central and Eastern European region. While Milena grew up in Bulgaria, I think we can nevertheless claim her as a little bit of a UM success story. Uh, she came to Maastricht back in 1996, um, she just told me, on a Matra um, scholarship from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs to study the Master of Public Health. And she and UM impressed each other uh, enough to stay together, and so she continued and pursued her PhD with a scholarship from the European Commission. Milena rose through the ranks um, as assistant professor and later as associate professor of health economics. A big and bold, and I dare to say, trailblazing career, seeing uh, as an international and in particular Eastern European academics at UM were not as much a given then as they are today. Even more impressive when you consider that all teaching in Gezondheidswetenschappen was completely in Dutch, and teaching can provide a very steep learning curve, also for our teachers. Um, Milena is a senior editor of the renowned academic journal, journal BMC Health Services Research, and the chair of the ESFER Working Group on Economic Evaluation and Healthcare in Europe. She is also a member of the scientific board of the Netherlands Red Cross, a place that I personally shared with her for a while, and she serves as a project assessor and project monitor for the European Commission. Milena has helped many to create many a new academic, in particular, in particular in her projects on informal payments. She has given many Eastern European scholars a chance to do their PhD research, while in the process of strengthening academic culture back in their respective home countries. Um, and of course, she really contributed to the international orientation of research school Capri. A lot of impact, far beyond academic findings of her research, which we always find very nice to see. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to cede the podium to Professor Milena Pavlova for her lecture towards robust and fair global health systems, all challenges in new realities. Dear Pro-Rector, members of the Executive Board of Maastricht University, of the Faculty of Health Medicine and Life Sciences, and Capri Research Institutes. Dear family and friends, I'm so pleased to see all of you here today and to give to you my inaugural address in this beautiful hall where 20 years ago I stood to defend my PhD thesis. In my address, I will uh, reflect on the global health systems and the challenges they face from the perspective of my research and in relation to the chair given to me. We now live longer than our ancestors, and even if we take the past 20 years only, we can see that about six to seven years have been added to the human life. Undab uh, undeniably, this average hides the huge differences uh, across the countries, with countries in Europe, America, and also Asia showing much higher life expectancy at birth than countries in Africa, uh, for example. Socioeconomic disparities, such as those related to housing, nutrition, water supply, literacy, and income, to name a few, 
can explain these differences, but healthcare provision also plays a prominent role. In particular, access to good quality, preventive, curative, and uh, long-term care services is one of the key determinants of health. Ensuring such services is, however, very costly. And therefore, it is not surprising that together with the increased life expectancy, also expenditure in health has been increasing. Globally, uh, we can see that uh, during the past uh, 20 years, uh, health expenditure has increased uh, from about 600 to nearly 1,400 international dollar per person per year. Again, there are striking differences across the countries. For example, Euro European countries are the biggest spender with more than 3,000 international dollars per person per year. This is 10 times higher than the health expenditure per capita in African countries, where not more than 300 international dollars per person per year are spent on average. These two extremes, uh, the very uh, high expenditure in Europe and very low expenditure in Africa, brings questions such as whether it is worth to spend so much on health in Europe, and is it beneficial for African countries to secure extra funding to reach the European levels. The answer to these questions has to do with scarcity of resources. Scarcity is often equalized with limitation. However, it is not so much about resources being limited, but rather resources having different uses. For our society, if our society chooses to spend more on healthcare, there will be fewer resources to spend on education, for example. If the benefit of spending more on healthcare is higher for society compared to the lost opportunity for spending more on education, then increased health spending is worthy. Otherwise, from an economic point of view, it is more rational to invest in education. Because of the scarcity of resources, we need to know if increased spending has additional value for society before we claim it acceptable. If we plot the life expectancy and health expenditure per capita together for all countries, in relative terms, we obtain a graph that can be best presented with a saturation curve. This average world data suggests that indeed increase health spending is associated with an increased life expectancy, although this graph says nothing about uh, causality of the relation. Still, this positive association is more pronounced in African countries, where extra health spending is linked to higher life expectancy gain, than in European countries, where extra, extra health spending has a more marginal association. This question, the merit of increasing health expenditure per capita in Europe, and it also urges more healthcare investments in African countries, given the potentially higher life expectancy gain. Two main challenges are entangled in this issue. How to make most of the available resources, uh, which we know as efficiency, and how to make sure that available resources are fairly distributed, which we know as equity. The efficiency and equity criteria have been generally accepted as social goals uh, guiding the global health systems throughout the years. Theoretically speaking, they both are important and can be achieved by employing the necessary tools. In practice, however, such tools are not readily available or not yet accepted, uh, uh, are not ad yet adapted to the different global contexts or not necessarily feasible given political, economic, social, and health system constraints. Another challenge is that, in some cases, a trade-off between efficiency and equity must be made. For example, with a health system, uh, greater efficiency can be achieved when encouraging concentration and specialization in health service provision. This refers to the notion of economy of scale and economy of scope. 
However, this would mean that people in need of healthcare who live far from those concentrated and specialized facilities will be underserved if they do not have the means or resources to travel to them. And this implies inequity. It is up to decision makers and society to decide whether in such a situation, efficiency or equity criteria should prevail. Such decisions are difficult because they uh, require value judgment given the conflict uh, between efficiency targets, moral values and social rights. In my research during the past 20 years, I have explored both efficiency and equity and some of their conflicting points, as well as the challenges they create for the global health systems. I will share some key insights of my research with reference to projects uh, where I was involved. I'm sure that family and friends in the audience are also curious to know I have been doing at the university so many years. My research started with the topic of out-of-pocket payments. And before I tell you more about my findings, let's first define what out-of-pocket payments are because there might be some confusions. Out-of-pocket payments are payments made by patients and their families uh, at the point of service use to the healthcare providers. A patient could be asked to pay a fee for visiting the physician, for uh, staying in the hospital, for obtaining uh, medicine or making use of medical device. When staying in the hospital, patient could be asked to pay a fee for meals, diagnostic tests, or medical supplies. Out-of-pocket payments are often confused with payments of monthly insurance premiums, which are paid by citizens irrespective of where they are sick or not. Insurance premiums are a form of solidarity and they do not fall in the category of out-of-pocket payments. Out-of-pocket payments are made by patients only for services they use and in fact, you can think of them as a tax on being sick. I guess you already see uh, some unfairness here. Out-of-pocket payments uh, have different scope and magnitude. What a patient pays for and how much depends on the country. As you can see on this graph, no clear pattern can be found. There are low-income countries like Mozambique where out-of-pocket payments form a very low share of the total health expenditure, but there are also low-income countries like Yemen, where um, uh, out-of-pocket payments form a very high share of uh, total health expenditure. The same huge variation can be found in, uh, for high-income countries like France and Singapore, uh, for example. We had a large European project funded under the FP7 program of the European Commission, where we specifically study out-of-pocket payments in Europe with data collection in six Central and Eastern European countries. One of the insights from this project uh, when analyzing data for all European countries was that uh, uh, the existence of out-of-pocket payment is a matter of historical development and political choice rather than a rational evidence-based uh, decision. We have seen this trend in the case of Hungary, which we studied together with Dr. Petra Bayi, and in the case of Bulgaria, which we studied together with Dr. Elka Atanasova. In Hungary, for example, changes for public, uh, charges for public health services were introduced by the government and then abolished the year after through a referendum initiated by the opposition. Also, in other European countries, including the Netherlands, uh, payments by patients have been used by political parties as a subject of pre-election campaigns. This politicization of out-of-pocket payments is rather striking, considering the enormous burden these payments can cause to patients and their family. There is ample evidence that asking patients to pay for services they need may create a barrier to using such services. As also shown by our FP7 projects, patient, 
charge, uh, charges hinder access to healthcare for patients who cannot pay. About one third of patients surveyed in Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, and Lithuania indicated that they had either needed to borrow money or sell assets or pay for health care or otherwise they forewent care uh, to avoid such payments. In Romania and Ukraine, this share was nearly 50%. So every second patient struggled with making uh, payments for health care. Also, a more recent study for Poland, carried out by Dr. Marjana Tambor and me for WHO Europe, confirmed that the situation had not changed substantially. In this project, we uh, studied catastrophic out-of-pocket uh, payments and their impoverishing effects. Let me explain a bit uh, these concepts. Households spend each year a certain uh, part of their budget on healthcare, and this spending is given here with the red arrow. As a result of this spending, the household budget is reduced, and this reduction is the drop from the blue point to a red point in this chart. Because the household budget is reduced, less can be spent on other things like buying food or paying for education, for example. Such change in the financial situation because of healthcare spending can affect both lower and higher income groups. The reduction in the household budget due to healthcare spending is not necessarily a problem, but it becomes a problem when the reduced budget goes under a given acceptable threshold, shown here as the dotted line. What is acceptable can, of course, um, vary across countries and settings, and there are also various ways to estimate this dotted line, uh, but I will not go into the methodology discussions here. I just want to summarize uh, some of the situations. When the annual household spending on healthcare is higher than the dotted line, then we say that the household experiences catastrophic payments, which is given as situation C here. Catastrophic payments mean that the household had to borrow money or sell assets to cover the healthcare costs, or in other words, the household spending has exceeded the household capacity to pay for healthcare. For some low uh, income households, the annual healthcare spending is not only catastrophic, but also pushes uh, the family uh, below the poverty line. And uh, we call that impoverishing effects. Uh, in, uh, for uh, other households uh, the, who are already poor, uh, healthcare payments can further, even further push them into poverty. The methods for estimation of catastrophic payments and their impoverishing effects are statistical methods that are widely applied in the literature, but there are still some methodology discussions. In particular, the group of being further impoverished, the group here, uh, has been overlooked in previous studies while it can be quite sizable. We have measured uh, catastrophic and impoverishing out-of-pocket payments for healthcare in Europe uh, in the two projects that I mentioned before, and also in small-scale projects in South Africa. For example, the project run by Dr. Chipo Mutiambizi, and in Myanmar, project run by Dr. Chao in Mint. Recently, we have also started new projects on this topic in Bhutan and Nepal, for example, within the framework of universal health coverage. Here you can see some selected results for uh, countries with a very different geographical location. The results are comparable to a certain extent because we use uh, the same or very similar uh, measurement methods, although the study population differ and we cannot make direct uh, conclusions. Nevertheless, the results show that catastrophic out-of-pocket payments and their impoverishing effects are not just a problem of low-income countries, as you might think, but they are a problem in all kinds of settings. Therefore, it is important to monitor these payments and take actions to diminish them 
if we want to achieve um, fair global health systems. This kind of studies, however, fail to capture another important equity problem, and this is the problem of foregoing services. To avoid the burden of out-of-pocket payments for healthcare and to meet other needs, some household members might simply choose not to use care or to use less care. Avoiding necessary care can further worsen their health status and can have devastating effects in terms of increasing disease uh, severity, decreased quality of life, and eventually a longer stay in hospital. Depending on who is uh, hospitalized, this could also mean inability to work and loss of income for the entire household. Measurement of uh, foregone services is rather difficult because it is difficult to determine whether services are foregone because uh, the health problem was minor or because of barriers such as out-of-pocket payments or traveling costs. Nevertheless, it is crucial to monitor this indicator as well to better understand to what extent health financing arrangements in a country protect its uh, population. If asking patients to pay creates such a barrier to healthcare, what is then the rationale for introducing such payments? Of course, patients pay for healthcare services that are used privately outside the basic package, but why are we charging patients for public health services in the basic package? Examples of such payments are payments by patients due to own risk, like here in the Netherlands, or co-payments uh, for healthcare, like in Belgium or in Bulgaria, for example. Such payments are also known as co-sharing, which means that the cost of the public health services are shared between the health insurer and the patient. What is the benefit of co-sharing? As found in a study that we carried together with Dr. Andriy Danilev, Patient charges for public health care services could make patients more cost conscious and could stimulate them to avoid unnecessary care. This could avoid the waste of public resources and could result in a more efficient uh, health system. Furthermore, patient charges for hospital care are expected to increase the cost of unhealthy behavior. So if people know the treatment of illness is very expensive, they will be stimulated to live healthier, like not smoking, mm, being physically more active, or also to seek uh, prevention, including vaccination and screening. These are very relevant theoretical expectations, but so far empirical research has been unable to confirm them. And this was also shown by the results of our project in this area, led by Dr. Reza Razayatmant. Consequently, at this moment, there is still little ground for implementing cost sharing in the public health sector for efficiency improvement. Another expectation is that patient charges can empower patients to demand services, uh, service quality that they desire. Also, if collected and retained at the point of service provision, patient charges can facilitate quality improvement locally, which can be crucial in resource poor settings. The opportunity to generate revenues from patient charges turns them into an additional source of healthcare system funding known as the cost recovery strategy. In fact, patients, uh, patient charges, desirable or not, have been filling gaps in public health funding around the world for many years. This is the case in many low-income countries where public uh, resources for healthcare are insufficient because of uh, economic uh, situation, but also because less priority is given to healthcare. Relying on patient payments to keep the health system functioning is, however, very problematic because patient charges are highly regressive. Whenever patient charge exists, Poor people spend a larger part of their income on healthcare than wealthy individuals, and this creates a severe inequity effect. 
You might already realize that there is also little ground for implementing patient charges in the public sector with cost recovery objective. Another objective assigned to the introduction of patient charges for public services is to deal with informal, informal under the table payments, especially in countries where these payments are directly requested by providers. It is expected that by allowing uh, healthcare providers to formally charge, informal payments can be formalized. Let's look a bit closer at the informal payments as we have some key studies conducted together with Dr. Tatiana Stepurko. The most important feature of informal payments is that they are not registered. There is no receipt or another account of these payments. And I do not mean here some small token of gratitude by thankful patients, but it is about under the table cash payment or sizable gifts that have the connotation of bribe. They can be in the form of money, put in an envelope, or expensive present, or in the form of favor exchange, and they can be given before, during, or after treatment. They can, uh, they can be requested by healthcare staff for paying extra attention to the patient, or they can be given by the patient or patient family to ensure faster or better services. They create an environment where even basic forms of politeness becomes a marketable good with a price attached to it. For some of you, those kind of payments might seem unthinkable because they are extremely unethical from a professional point of view, but they are not always illegal because countries' uh, laws and regulation often fail to define their status, and what is not forbidden is often uh, perceived as allowed, especially when there is a practical need of it. In fact, informal payments uh, for healthcare flourish in health systems that are underfunded, poorly governed, and fail to meet patient expectations for quality care. They are a kind of compensating mechanism that can ensure the right care at the right time, even in a failing health system. This compensating mechanism is not limited to wealthy individuals, the survey in the six Eastern European countries that we carried out in our FP7 project showed uh, that such payments are made by all kinds of socioeconomic groups for all kinds of services. Let me, however, clarify that informal payments are not specific to the post-communist context only. They are a problem in many health systems around the world with evidence of their existence also in countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and even in high-income uh, countries in Europe, like Greece and Turkey. This means that informal under-the-table payment are not an indication of communist past, but they are indication of social acceptance of informalities and bribes. Informal payments affect uh, the health system in a very complex manner. To start with, they undermine the health policy uh, priorities set by the government. Uh, uh, the, the existence of these payments is a problem for health policy. The informal cash payments goes directly from the patient to healthcare staff in publicly funded healthcare facility and remains unregistered. In view of this, informal payments hinder the estimation of future funding requirements for the health sector. The existence of informal payments can also obstruct the attempt to improve the technical efficiency of healthcare provision. In fact, these payments may introduce incentives for providing less cost-effective care if there are patients who are willing to pay for it informally. Significant quality improvement as a result of informal payments exists seldom. Overall, we found that healthcare providers are not interested in reinvesting these payments in their practices, but they rather add them to their earnings because of the low salaries. The most adverse effect, of course, of informal payments is equity effects. When informal payments are uh, established as a practice, patients who cannot afford to pay informally either avoid or delay seeking care 
or they take loan or sell assets to be able to cover these payments. As we also found in our FP7 project, official charges do not have the ability to eliminate the informal payments and their introduction results in a mixture of formal and informal payments by patients. To deal with informal payments, we need sufficient funding, a good quality of care, and adequate governance. If these factors are in place, the informal payments will naturally uh, disappear as they did in Western European countries uh, some time ago. Next to the study, on uh, informal payments, formal and informal payments. I also was involved in an international project funded by DG Sante, which focused on health promotion, particularly health promotion among older adults. One of our contributions to this project was related to the use of e-health and m-health technology in health promotion and primary prevention. We identified various types of e-health and m-health tools used in health promotion programs, namely apps, websites, devices, uh, video consults, and webinars, and we assess their application in public health interventions targeting older adults. We found that e-health and m-health tools can be successfully used in health promotion programs for older adults to monitor and improve their health. However, the use of this technology greatly depends on older adults' motivation and trust. Reported interventions are also associated with other key facilitators and barriers, like uh, adequacy of information and support that the older adults receive, usability, accessibility, and others. I continue exploring this topic uh, because I find it crucial for enhancing sustainability of the health systems. Positive changes in health-related lifestyle could improve population health and further increase life expectancy, which in turn might reduce the need of major investments in medical care. In light of this, I would like to bring your attention to the topic of non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases, like uh, cardiovascular diseases, for example, have long characterized the morbidity patterns of high-income countries and have been particularly observed among population groups with lower income and less education. However, other parts of the world are increasingly being confronted with such health inequalities as well. I will want to show you one example from South Africa. Using country representative data, we estimated the concentration index and concentration curves related to uh, distribution of uh, obesity among uh, wealth groups. Concentration index and uh, the related concentration curves are largely used as a measure of inequality. The concentration curve illustrates how a specific feature, like obesity, uh, is uh, uh, distributed among the wealth groups. To find the concentration curve, we need to plot the data on a coordinate, like the one you see here, where the x-axis represents the cumulative percentage of the study population ranked by wealth, and the y-axis indicates the corresponding cumulative percentage of the characteristic being studied, like uh, uh, obesity. The concentration curve is compared to the line of perfect equality when there is uh, no considerable difference, uh, then uh, we talk about absence of inequalities. If, however, uh, the specific condition is more prevalent or more concentrated among the wealthier individuals, the concentration curve will be considerably below the equity line. And if the uh, uh, health condition is more prevalent among the poor, the concentration curve will be considerably above the equity line. We can measure the degree of concentration through the concentration index. As, uh, let me show you the results that we had for South Africa. As can be seen here from the study result, 
There is a pro-rich inequality associated with obesity in South Africa, as indicated by the concentration curve located under the equality line. These results contrast the European results, for example, where it shows that low-income groups in Europe are those who suffer more of obesity, while in case of South Africa, the situation is the opposite. Also, we have found that uh, in South Africa, inequalities among men are larger than among women. However, when we look at the distribution of the, of the prevalence of obesity, we can see that more women in South Africa are obese than men. This specific finding is very uh, important and illustrates the fact that absence of inequality does not mean absence of health problem. If the health problem is more equally distributed uh, across um, the groups, we will not observe uh, it as an inequity, but we, there will still be still, still a health problem, like obesity among women uh, in South Africa. Therefore, national health policies uh, should be combined with targeted programs. In this case, in the example of South Africa, they should target not only wealthy men, but also women of all wealth uh, groups. Next to efficiency and equity, uh, in uh, healthcare and uh, public health, I have also recently been involved in research on long-term care systems. Uh, and let me briefly share some insights from that part of my research. Long-term care refers to social and medical care provided to individuals who no longer can perform uh, their regular everyday activities due to chronic uh, health problems. Therefore, they need assistance to meet their health or personal care needs. This type of care can be uh, different in form and can be provided by institutions or professionals at um, the home of the uh, patient or by friends or neighbors. I was uh, privileged to receive the 2016 AXA Award which I used to study the financing and organization of long-term care systems in Europe together with a group of researchers. My motivation for exploring this topic was the aging population and austerity measures in Europe at that time that represent major challenges to European societies. They also questioned the sustainability of the long-term care systems. In this project, we outline a general perspective on how European countries fund and organize their long-term care systems and how they intend to do that in future. As we found in this project, long-term care is an important concern for both Western and Eastern European countries. However, the dilemmas they face are very different. Western European countries have extensive long-term care structures established with the support of the state. As government are pressed to restrict their spending, est establishing, uh, ensuring long-term care for all is becoming more and more a challenge in, Eastern Europe, in Western European countries. In Eastern European countries, the resources for long-term care institutions are hardly available and long-term care provision is largely a family matter. However, the decreasing family size and increasing number of working women are calling for new forms of long-term care in this region as well. Families cannot longer care for all the family, uh, family members on their own, and they need the support of institutions and regulators. I continue to work on this topic in an international project where we are assessing the effects of care transition, particularly related to the management and financing of long-term care in Europe. Finally, I would like to mention a subject that I find extremely important when discussing health systems, and this is the subject of maternal care. 
indicators such as maternal mortality and morbidity, morbidity are part of global health indicators. Maternal physical and mental health is crucial to children's development and well-being. Every child needs a healthy mother. I have been involved in research on maternal care parallel to the topics I mentioned before, starting with a study in the Netherlands on the choice of place of birth by low-risk uh, pregnant women. Together with Dr. Marike Hendricks, we carried out a discrete choice experiment to understand why some Dutch women opt for home birth and others prefer a hospital setting. As we found, fear of pain and emergency situations are push factors for hospital birth. Later, together with Dr. Elena Mitenice and Dr. Lela Schengelia, we explore maternal care in Central and Eastern European countries, focusing on out-of-pocket payments and other non-financial barriers. The starting point was the contradiction between the macro indicators and the maternal mortality ratios in this region. It is now established from empirical research, including research we have done in this region, that maternal care suffers major drawbacks, despite the motivation declared by the Central and Eastern European governments to improve maternal care, and despite the adjustment of medical guidelines that took place during the transition period. Major drawbacks include inequality in access, inefficient distribution of resources, no account of women's preferences, slow diffusion of uh, innovation, and financial barrier to access due to formal and informal charges. Following these uh, European studies, I participated in research on maternal care in resource-poor settings where maternal mortality is an uh, extraordinary problem even when compared to that in Central and Eastern Europe. As you can see here, women in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are at extremely high risk of dying during birth or pregnancy-related causes. International efforts have succeeded in diminishing this problem, but still the maternal mortality rates are unacceptably high, especially because majority of these deaths are avoidable. Digitalization in maternal care could perhaps bring some further improvements, but we still have a long way to go to achieve adequate and fair maternal health care provision globally. We have studied maternal care issues in Zambia together with Dr. Cholve Muziamba and in Burkina Faso together with Dr. Hilarison and also in Ghana and Nigeria with Dr. Jaco Ogondele and Dr. Martin Ayanore. We also have some new projects in this area on reproductive care in Pakistan and malaria among pregnant women in Myanmar. My ambition for the future as holder of the chair Health Economics and Equity is to continue to explore efficiency and equity in the global health systems. In particular, I would like to explore the integration of these two criteria in um, new economic evaluation frameworks. Such frameworks are needed in order to make most of the available resources by allocating those resources in a fair manner. In relation to this chair, I also would like to explore the topic of value-based payment models, which we already studied together with Katerina Hospital in the Netherlands, but also with some researcher in Saudi Arabia, for example. This is a new and challenging topic, but highly important for both high and low income countries that wish to create robust and fair health systems. My ambition is also to continue to contribute to in, in the international character of Capri Research Institute, the faculty and the university at large. I will do that by training students in bachelor's and master programs and by training young researchers working at various settings around the world. My objective is to help them become outstanding and passionate researchers able to make differences in their healthcare realities. 
I see this capacity building element of my work as my social impact. I feel proud of their excellent PhD thesis and thesis defenses, like the one by Dr. Tatenda Ziniemba uh, last December, and also Bobby Presley this Monday. I also appreciate the opportunity to continue working with them on new projects and supervising new PhD students together in future. From the position of this chair, I also intend to intensify my relationship with other researchers and, uh, teach and other teaching programs within and also outside the university. I see plenty, plenty of opportunities uh, doing so, given my growing professional network. I especially value the possibility to establish and chair the ASFER Working Group on Economic Evaluation in Healthcare in Europe, and also being active member of the Board of Red Cross, the Netherlands. Both roles have extremely uh, important meaning to me, and they are very enriching, and I hope we can soon achieve new, even more ambitious accomplishments. At the end of my inaugural address, I would like to express my appreciations to everyone who has traveled with me through my professional journey. First and foremost, my gratitude to the members of the Executive Board of Maastricht University, a Faculty of Health Medicine and Life Sciences, and Capri Research Institute for um, making the Chair of Health Economics Inequity possible and also for trusting me. I would like to include in this the former and current dean of our faculty, Professor Albert Herbier and Professor Annemie Schultz, the former and current vice dean, Professor Nanny de Vries, and uh, Professor Steph Kremers, and also uh, the former and current chair of Capri Research Institute, Professor Maurice Zechers and Professor Sylvia Evers, as well as the chair of the Department of Health Services Research, Professor Dirk Ruart. Looking back through the years, I would like to acknowledge the support of many colleagues with whom I have, honor, I have been honored to work during the years. My gratitude goes to Professor Wim Hrot and Professor Fritz van Merode, who are my PhD promoters and with whom I continue to work. I thank them for believing in me back then at the start of my research career and also for all academic advices, encouragement, and good words through the years. I have successfully supervised a number of PhD students together with Wim, and the number of the PhD students who explicitly request our supervision is only growing. I must say we do good work when I see the excellent thesis and the touchy acknowledgements that they include. Thank you, Wim. Also, the PhD project I supervised together with Fritz is an important one. I enjoyed very much not only academic discussions, but also discussions about philosophy, history, geography, and even linguistic. Thank you, Fritz. Let me also thank our support staff, especially Sus, Bridget, and Janet, uh, for always being open to help. I really admire their ability to fix an appointment, even if you challenge them with the most complicated uh, calendars. Thank you. And also special thanks to Sus Kune for making the event today possible. Thank you very much. Next, let me thank our Health Economics and HTA group, including Sylvia, Agi, Mikael, Inge, Wim, Rubin, Ingrid, and Ghislaine. We have great ambitions, and our meetings always run short, but they have been always great support to me, especially during the last two years online. The same goes for our master HPM program group, which will be now uh, coordinated by Ariane and Dan. I wish them all the success in this new endeavor. Also, let me mention here Mark Hovers, the planning group veteran, in my uh, health economics, uh, in my financial management course, as well as the brilliant guest lecturers, including Fleur Hazard, uh, Leon Habetz from AZM, Cyril Janssen from West Park, who are 
probably here today. Thank you for your support. I wish to thank all colleagues from the Department of International Health, Department of Health Ethics and Society, Department of Social Medicine, Department of Public Health Genomics, Department of Epidemiology, and Department of Methodology and Statistics, with whom I am working closely in the bachelor programs European Public Health, Master Program Global Health, and Bachelor uh, Specialization Prevention and Health. The list of names is really long, and I have no possibility to thank all of them individually as I wish, but I would like to express my gratitude for the enjoyable planning group meetings and fruitful cooperation that are vital for the success of the research units we deliver together. Outside the faculty, I appreciate my involvement in the Bachelor of Health Policy course at the University uh, College Maastricht, which was initiated by Professor Hans Marse and is now coordinated by Professor Dirk Ruart. Dear Hans and Dirk, thank you for supporting me through the years. I also uh, highly appreciate my involvement in UNOMERIT uh, study program working closely with uh, Mindel van der Laar and uh, Mirte van uh, Engelshoven, as well as Francisca Gassman. Thank you for this collaboration. Moving from teaching to research, I would like to thank to all former and current PhD students with whom I have worked in the past and I'm working at the moment. Our bi-weekly meetings are making my uh, work extremely enjoyable traveling in a day from Indonesia to India and Ethiopia, and from Lebanon to Latvia and Canada. Your topics are highly relevant and highly challenging, and I'm sure you will all do just fine given the motivation and enthusiasm you have. I also want to thank all international group of researchers with whom I have uh, collaborated in various projects, especially Tanya, Magena, Petra, Luba, Rehin, and Desi, who have become my academic buddies through the years and also very good friends. Many thanks also to the colleagues from the ASWAR working group uh, on economic evaluation, including Rusica and Lorena, who are here with us, and also colleagues involved in the Red Cross uh, Scientific Committee initiated by Kemal uh, Aslan Tas. Last but not least, my thanks to colleagues from Hungary, Petra Bai and Laszlo Gulacci, for granting me the title Honorary Professor in their department. On my personal note, I would like to acknowledge the support of all colleagues from the former department Bayos, where my research career started, and all colleagues from the HSR department, where I'm working now, and a special thanks to Federica Angeli for uh, the fun we had sharing office together, even though she was not able to travel to this event. I would like also to thank my friends whom I was not able to see such a long time, including all members of family Paras Schraven, who have been like family to me in the Netherlands even though not all are with us today. Also, thank you. I also want to thank all friends from my Dutch language club, from my Bulgarian connections club, from my Greek connections club, and from my good ex-colleagues club. Thank you all being here and, and for being there uh, for me when it's needed. At the end of every thank you words comes the time to thank the family. Also the family who is watching uh, online uh, today. I am indebted to my parents and my sister and her family for all they have done for me and especially for putting up with me living so far. Uh, I know it has not been easy, but I'm so glad to have my mother with me today it is such an honor. Thank you for making this possible. I'm also indebted to my husband and my children for putting up with my busy time schedule, 
for being so understanding and for all appreciation and respect I get. You are simply wonderful. How to meet her? I could not have anything better than our fun love Esperanto home. Thank you enormously. Finally, let me acknowledge all participants in our studies, including patients, physicians, managers, policy makers, and other healthcare professionals. Although they re remain anonymous, as it should be in research, the data they provide make this research possible. I have said. Well, Professor Pavlova, dear Milena, thank you very much. I think after this very nice lecture, it's clear that there is a lot of disturbing inequity to, um, to be studied and to, to be solved. And it's also very good to hear that throughout the course of the years, you have gathered a very large network in order to help you with, uh, with studying this, uh, this very important topic in, your, uh, in the rest of your um, career. And maybe we can even toast to the next 25 years at UM uh, for you today, because um, this is the point where I close the official part um, of this academic session. And we will now go to the reception, which is in the garden. And um, if you will follow us, you will get there automatically. Um, one piece of advice, um, do not get in the line behind all those professors. Um, but distribute over the garden and look for a moment where um, Professor Pavlova is available to, um, to receive your uh, congratulations. Um, I think no out-of-pocket payments in the reception. <laughs> no bribes. Maybe a small gift. <laughs> Might be nice. Um, but I think um, I, Malena is now available to receive your congratulations, and I wish everybody um, a very nice day. Also, the people online are here with close this session. <laughs>